Hello there guys. We, in the modern day, typically have this stereotyped view that cultures in the past started out pretty strict and conservative and then gradually over time became more lax and tolerant, at least as far as norms towards clothing and fashion goes. 200 years ago, if you were going out for a morning stroll down a public street in the United States, you would probably look like this, with pretty much your entire body being completely covered except for your face and maybe your hands. It was seen as immodest and perhaps inappropriate for a woman to dress otherwise and similar public fashion restrictions existed for men. There was a time where even men showing off their bare chest was considered unseemly. If you didn't meet these social standards, you might get dirty looks from your neighbors, or maybe even the cops called on you. And keep in mind that such practices occurred even in climates and situations where such attire wasn't even the most comfortable thing to wear. However, as we know, ultimately these norms towards clothing, at least in many Western countries, shifted and became more lenient, revealing more skin and showing more parts of the body in public. Skirts and shorts showing lower legs were permitted. Shirts and blouses cut deeper, revealing more of the chest. Sleeves showed more of the arms. Until you get to today, where in public you might see somebody's stomach, a thing that might have given your 19th century ancestors a heart attack, and nobody will even bat an eye. You don't have to go to the beach looking like this anymore. Nonetheless, in truth, history tells us the simple linear path from modest to scandalous wasn't always the case. Many cultures hold different attitudes towards nudity and modesty than our own. Cultures in Africa, the Americas, Asia, Polynesia, Australia, and yes, even Europe, thought, and many still think, very differently, with incredible minimal clothing, for instance, not being taboo, but being the norm. A good anthropologist knows that these things have definitely varied a lot from culture to culture and from time to time. And there really is no universal concept of shame or modesty when it comes to clothing and showing off your pod. And in no culture do I think this is clearer than in my all-time favorite examples of this, the Minoan civilization of Bronze Age Crete, or as I like to call them for reasons that will become clear, the, the Jojo's, Jojo's Bizarre, Bizarre Adventure culture. culture. A culture in ancient history that was totally chill with women walking around with their boobs out, but gods forbid wouldn't let them show their darn ankles. So today, I will be giving you guys an in-depth discussion of these ancient and mysterious peoples, handling everything from their rise and fall, to their habits and traditions, and perhaps my personal favorite, their fashion. Shout out to Artist Marie for providing me with some amazing illustrations for this video. Crete is one of the largest and most populous of the modern day Greek islands, and has been continually inhabited by humans far into prehistory for at least 130,000 years. Sitting in an economically advantageous position between the Greek mainland and Egypt and the Near East, unsurprisingly, the island boasted a long and rich history even in antiquity. The ancient Greeks of the 8th century BC regarded it as a strange and mysterious land, different from the other islands in this part of the Mediterranean. The cities on Crete were old and crumbling in a state of decay when Athens and Sparta were still young. Homer describes it in his Odyssey as beautiful and fertile surrounded by waves, and the people who live there are so many you can't even count them. They have 90 cities. Visitors to the island described a landscape littered with the ruins of massive maze-like palaces, the remains of some advanced civilization who had once been great but had since fallen into decline, giving rise to many myths and legends as to their origins. The cruel king Minos was said to rule Crete before the Trojan War, stealing Athenian youths and feeding them to the monstrous Minotaur, a creature half bull and half man which dwelled in the endless maze underneath his palace in the city of Knossos. For millennia, this pre-Greek period of Crete and the great palace-building civilization that once existed on it was largely forgotten by history. It was really only in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries that this lost culture was rediscovered and eventually better understood, mainly through the work of English archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans. His excavations helped uncover a large and prosperous civilization that flourished on Crete from around 3000 BC to 1400 BC, which he called the Minoan civilization, after the legendary king Minos in Greek mythology. He and countless other archaeologists have since uncovered homes, tools, pottery, writing, and artwork as well as some human remains belonging to this culture, shrouded in mystery. The Rise of a People To truly get a sense of scale of how far back and how long this civilization existed for is just mind-boggling. They were probably about as ancient as somebody like Jesus or Alexander the Great, 
as these guys are to us, and apparently they endured for almost 2,000 years. Just think about that. Even by the time Homer wrote his epics, the Minoans were a long-gone memory. Evans determined that there was at least three distinct periods or eras over the course of the civilization, and it seems that the governments and social structures of these people almost completely collapsed, only to bounce back again several times in their long history, until their final gradual declines towards the Bronze Age collapse. Now, the exact dating of these periods is messy, and other archaeologists have since created more nuanced timelines that somewhat disagree with Evans' originals. Much of the murkiness surrounding not only the timeline, but many aspects of Minoan culture, is due to the fact the primary language of the Minoans, called Linear A, is to this day undeciphered. We have countless clay tablets and discs with the writings of these people on them, and no doubt they would have much to tell us, but the thing is that they might as well be gibberish for all the good they do us, considering we have no way to read them. Despite Linear A being related to the better understood Linear B, the precursor to Greek, Attempts to translate Minoan writings have largely been met with failure, in incoherent words and sentences. The Minoan language, being unrelated to any other known language, is extinct, and at the moment it appears like it will unfortunately stay that way. As a result, much of what we know about them is based on conjecture from their artwork, material culture, and constructions, as well as from contemporary accounts coming from their neighboring cultures, such as the Egyptians. And not the Ptolemies, I'm talking about the OG Egyptians who built the pyramids and crap. The earliest appearance of the likely ancestors to the Minoans appear on Crete in the Neolithic period, in small and modest fishing villages and huts along the coastline, which gave no hint to their grand future. These people might have even encountered and possibly hunted the prehistoric dwarf elephants that inhabited the island before the arrival of humans. They appear to have originated from the Levant, or Middle East, reaching the remote island by sizable boat migrations. Curiously, these earliest villages, just like the cities and palaces they would eventually become, were not fortified or even walled. These open, unprotected communities would become a staple of Minoan culture, as throughout their reign, the Minoans appear to have cared little in the ways of war, both offensive and defensive. Perhaps the natural geography of Crete with its mountains and sheer cliffs provided all the necessary defense they needed from mainland invaders. The island could also be very fertile though, and these early settlers brought with them domesticated animals like cattle, pigs, sheep, as well as food crops like barley, peas, wheat, and olive trees. This sunny and hot land with its cool sea breezes provided a stable region for which towns could develop with ever-growing populations. And so they did. The early Minoan period saw the rise of great cities like Knossos, Phaistos, and Malia, as Crete became a popular hub for trade and commerce in the late 3rd millennium BC. This prosperity is best understood by the extensive seafaring trade networks the Minoans developed. By 2000 BC, Crete was exporting great amounts of wine, pottery, artwork, food, and saffron all throughout the ancient world, using the Mediterranean Sea as their great highway. Egyptians portrayed Minoan diplomats and merchants bringing gifts on the walls of some of their tombs, referring to them as people of the islands of the Middle Sea. Minoan artifacts are also found on the Greek mainland and in the land of Canaan, where the precursors to the Israelites were just getting their start. These trade relations might have extended as far as in what is now France and even Spain, as some Minoan goods have been excavated in these regions. The Golden Age of the Minoan civilization hit its peak around the 17th and 16th centuries BC. By the Middle Minoan period, the civilization and its cities were rich beyond measure. And as rich people do, they built giant mansions for themselves. The palaces of Crete are renowned for their beauty and elaborate architecture, and even today are viewed as feats of great ingenuity. Some were massive multi-storied structures with staircases, skylights, columns, and courtyards. Like many Minoan constructs, they had an intricate maze-like quality to them, and were at least in part used for administrative and governmental purposes, as many have large storerooms and archives within them. Art depicting scenes of animals, plants, the ocean, and daily life decorated and colored the stone walls of these immense buildings. But perhaps most amazing of all was the fact that these palaces had running water. That's right, some people had indoor plumbing almost 4,000 years ago, with centralized heating systems, bathtubs with hot and cold water taps, and even toilets that could flush. All of this was possible through the use of expertly crafted sewage drainage systems, which used clay pipes and aqueducts, thousands of years before the Romans. Now, this isn't to say that all Minoans enjoyed such a life of modern luxury. We know that many of these amenities were only reserved for the Minoan elite, a noble ruling class. Down the boulevards and streets of Knossos, peasants and slaves lived in pretty crappy small urban housing projects. 
Nonetheless, it appears that the Minoan civilization was largely a stable and peaceful society, which is rather odd for its time. Most evidence generally shows that the Minoans were neither conquerors nor invaders, essentially content with their native island and a few surrounding holdings. A few guard outposts and some walls have been discovered, but nothing really extensive. We have no substantial proof to illustrate that the Minoans even had an army, or that they dominated peoples beyond Crete itself. Artwork rarely depicts violence between people beyond in muck or game-like settings. The few Minoan weapons that have been recovered appear to be more or less designed for sporting and display purposes such as tourney swords and spears, rather than designed for practical battle application. All of this greatly contrasts some of their contemporaries such as the Egyptians and the Hittites, whose exploits in warfare and evidence for such are well known and easy to find. They might have had a naval fleet with some intimidating longboats, but we don't have much to go off besides that. Now, this isn't to say the Minoans didn't engage in warfare, but it appears they very well might have relied primarily on peaceful negotiations with trade, and used war only under rare circumstances and in smaller conflicts. It is really only in the late Minoan period, towards the fall of the civilization, that we see an increase in fortifications, defense, and weaponry on Crete. But what was social life like in ancient Minoan Crete during its height? Who was in charge? How would you interact with your friends? Most importantly, how would you get dressed up in the morning? Well, again, many of the specifics of Minoan society are still largely a mystery due to our inability to read their texts. Most social norms and practices have been inferred from paintings and artwork, and it should be important to preface that a lot of this information is conjecture, and still debated by scholars. And who knows, a bunch of this might be archaeologists looking way too deep into things, as they are known to do sometimes. The Minoans are best characterized as a vibrant, proud, and fun-loving society that was incredibly interested in the human figure, nature, the sea, and had a knack for elegance and complexity. Almost every aspect of their society was needlessly intricate from their houses to their clothing. And let's start there, with the most striking aspect of Minoan culture, and what got me interested in them in the first place, their preferred clothing for both men and women, which was, well, freaking wacky and I absolutely love it. Minoan fashion was perhaps one of the most sophisticated textile industries in the ancient world, perfecting several unique weaving and dyeing methods to yield extravagant and colorful attire to be worn by both sexes. Now, it is hard to determine the exact pieces of clothing that would have constituted typical Minoan dress, because our understanding is largely based on damaged and reconstructed stylized artwork, and some may say these were reconstructed poorly, but nonetheless we have a decent idea of what would have been worn and how. If you were a man in the Minoan civilization, let's just say it would probably be really easy to get dressed up in the morning, as your daily dress consisted of very, very minimal clothing. You'd pretty much be close to naked and scantily clad from head to toe by our modern standards. But that isn't to say male clothing wasn't flashy. Many have used the famous Prince of Lilies fresco to get a good idea of how fabulous male Minoan fashion was, showing off a bare chest, arms, and legs. Unlike the much later Greeks who preferred long flowing tunics, the Minoans chose to wear a simple codpiece or loincloth, essentially a thong to hide the dudes, well, you know. This codpiece was sometimes worn alone, but at other times it was paired with a type of short kilt or skirt. In some versions this skirt was closed at both sides, and thus covered the butt and upper thighs, while in others it remained open on the sides to be a bit more, um, uh, revealing. This garb would have given male Minoans a great deal of flexibility and movement. The codpiece in particular might have greatly assisted in sports and other physical activities, possibly functioning a bit like a jockstrap. If there's one thing the Minoans loved, it was their belts, and I mean a lot. A thin waist in both men and women appears to have been greatly prized. Both sexes are almost always shown wearing tight-fitting belts around their waists, possibly made of metal or leather, which tighten their stomachs in, giving them an hourglass or wasp figure. It is possible that such attire was intended to shape the body of the wearer, much like a corset, and wearing such body-shaping belts began at a young age. Men had long flowing hair swept away from their brow, and cascading down their backs in ponytails and serpentine curls. Additionally, both men and women bathed daily, and invested a great deal of time into smelling and looking good. Noble classes might have spent hours caring for their skin, eyebrows, and face, utilizing massage techniques, plucking, shaving, and makeup. Minoan guys also wore a lot more jewelry than Minoan women. It is common to see them depicted covered in beads and armbands, with ribbons, tassels, chains of pearls, and leather nets hung about their decorative kilts during festivals. 
It is also said that the Minoans introduced hatwear into Europe, as many sported headbands and opulent crowns. Footwear appears to have been rare, and most Minoans walked around completely barefoot, especially indoors. I find the sexy style of clothing worn by Minoan men very reminiscent to the Pillar Men, particularly cars from the Japanese anime Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and I'm guessing these guys look pretty dang gorgeous when they got really decked out. This style of dress was typical of early Minoan men, but as time went on it appears that in the latter centuries of the civilization, male dress became more and more conservative. Tunics and long flowing robes, which covered the chest, arms, and legs, coupled with shorts, called the garments of foreigners, were likely introduced to Crete from the Greek mainland, and gradually grew more popular over time, until Minoan dress was virtually indistinguishable from the more familiar classical Greek clothing we see in the movies. Towards their end, the vibrant, risque fashion of the Minoan men faded into the past, and was replaced with the far more moderate and concealing styles. Feminine Minoan fashion was magnificent in its own right, and it greatly contrasted that of males in many ways. It should be noted that the two sexes shared little overlapping clothing. Women commonly wore more restrictive garments that hid more of their body. Lady Minoans depicted in figurines and paintings are almost always completely covered from neck to feet, with the exception of the forearms and breasts. Women are rarely represented in short skirts or clothing that reveals the upper legs or thighs, much unlike Minoan men, suggesting that showing these body parts in public apart from on special occasions might have been seen as indecent or maybe even inappropriate. Showing off your feet also appears to have been off limits as well. Most female skirts extend all the way to the ankles, leaving them barely visible, meaning Quentin Tarantino would have been in no luck on ancient Crete. The most favored piece of their wardrobe appears to have been an extremely elaborate and long type of dress, perhaps best characterized by the famous snake goddess figurines. The top bodice was worn tight, sometimes with a tall, stiff collar. The skirts of these dresses were colorful and decorated with all kinds of geometric patterns, and had a wide, bell-like shape, and might have been supported by a frame underneath, kind of resembling that of Victorian women. But with one crucial difference. The most eye-drawing part of the dress, at least for us, must be its open bodice design. Starting from about the navel and up to the shoulders, a large opening or gash left the woman's chest completely exposed, emphasizing her breasts, which were typically left completely bare. Now, such a sight today would probably be seen as completely inappropriate, but it appears that this level of public nudity on display was not taboo in the slightest to the Minoans, and perhaps it was even expected for a woman to regularly go topless when they were out on the town. Boobs to the Minoans were not something best covered up, but something that was supposed to be shared and revealed to the world. One of the few pieces of clothing shared between men and women were curious apron-like decorative plaques or panels sewn into skirts or hung about waists. These plaques depicted icons of things like palm leaves, dolphins, cuttlefish, and butterflies. Their exact use is unknown, but perhaps they worked like badges, displaying the symbols of noble houses or family ties, or maybe even serve some kind of religious function. We just don't know. Lastly, Minoan women, just like their men, wore their hair long in distinctive snake-like curls that were oily black. Behold, your average early middle Minoan couple. Don't they look fantastic? Society the structure and hierarchy of the Minoan society is largely a mystery, but we can infer it was definitely very gendered. Just as we see in their clothing, artwork displays that there was a clear division between men and women in this society. Men always have darker bronze skin, while women have fairer, paler white skin. Some have interpreted this to suggest women largely stayed inside, while men did most outdoor labor. Much attention has been drawn to scenes depicting social interactions and possible relationships between the two genders. There are many frescoes showing elite females seemingly in positions of power and authority over men. Some archaeologists have pointed out that we have an excess of scenes depicting Minoan women sitting down and attended by male servants, but no illustrations of men in similar positions of authority. We actually have no representations of males even sitting down from this period. Women are also shown to engage in what contemporary cultures would have considered primarily masculine behaviors. For instance, we see both genders participating side by side in hunts and sporting events. The Minoan religion seems to have been very female-oriented. It is speculated that female priestesses led important rituals and festivals on Crete. Figurines supposedly depicting goddesses stress many feminine qualities and characteristics. Other components of the religion appear to have been that of nature and plant life, as well as eroticism and sexuality. All this circumstantial evidence has led some historians to speculate that the women in the Minoan civilization might have demonstrated a great deal of power and female rights. 
A few have even gone as far to posit that the Minoans might have had an outright matriarchy where women served as great leaders and were in charge. Maybe, or maybe not, again it is hard to say without being able to get their side on the matter from their writings. I think it is safe to say that ancient Crete was probably not the ultra-peaceful, hippie, feminist utopia some have made it out to be. Even so, out of its ancient contemporaries, it might have not been too bad. Further research to better understand the exact relationships men and women shared on Crete are definitely necessary to help clear up this debate. Interestingly, there is some speculation on if homosexual relationships, namely between males, might have been permitted in the Minoan civilization. Aristotle seems to imply that homosexual relationships were well known on Crete in his day, and that these traditions extend very far back. And it very well might have been that the classical Greeks might have gotten their more favorable attitudes towards homosexuality from the Minoans. Lastly, the Minoans loved their great festivals and pageantry. One of their all-time favorite pastimes appeared to have been bull leaping, or jumping, where scantily clad men and women would perform daring and acrobatic feats by grabbing onto the horns of charging bulls and using the animal's violent jerks to launch themselves over their backs and do all kinds of spins and flips, while stadiums filled with hundreds of onlookers would cheer and shout in approval. Bulls and bull leaping are extremely well represented in Minoan artwork, so it might have been a key facet of their society and religion. And perhaps this is where the Greek myth of the bull-headed minotaur derives from, as a tristed half-recollection of traditional Minoan culture, hundreds of years later. What exactly happened to the Minoans is just as mysterious as the Minoans themselves. Seemingly, after just reaching the peak of their sophisticated and colorful culture, they began to decline. It is likely no single thing brought about this decline, and it was not a rapid event but a gradual and slow fall. We know that a devastating volcanic eruption, one of the largest in recorded history, occurred on the island of Thera between 1642 and 1540 BCE, and this coincided with the end of the Middle Minoan Golden Era. The Minoan city that existed on Thera was completely destroyed in an instant, and the ash and other debris that covered it left it in a state of stunning preservation akin to the Roman city of Pompeii. This devastating event, sometimes referred to as the Minoan Eruption, was felt in many cultures throughout the ancient world at that time, from Egypt to even China. The Minoans on the very nearby island of Crete would suffer the brunt of these impacts through earthquakes, tsunamis, and horrific food shortages. The lasting effects of this disaster are unclear, but it is likely to have pushed the civilization into a crisis, leaving them very vulnerable. Soon afterwards, Crete would be invaded by Greek mainlanders, the warlike Mycenaeans. Weaponry and military strongholds become much more in evidence on Crete during this period. The invading Mycenaeans began to overthrow and occupy many formerly Minoan settlements. We also see Minoan culture progressively shift to becoming more similar to that of their conquerors. Minoan ideas, religion, clothing, and society slowly began to dwindle as time went on. Knossos remained an important center of trade, but many of the other once great cities and palaces of these people were abandoned and left to crumble into ruins. One of the last vestiges of their civilization appears to have been a defensive holdfast high up in the mountains before the Minoans vanished from history altogether between 1500 BC and 1300 BC. Because of this, many historians have theorized if they were in fact the legendary Atlantids, of which Plato spoke of, whose grand civilization sunk beneath the waves. But the Minoans did not entirely die out, per se. It seems that some refugees fled their native homeland and ended up on the Greek mainland, these Minoans interbred with the very Mycenaeans who conquered them, and over time the two merged elements of both their cultures together. It can be said that the classical Greeks, who would descend from this blending, owe much to these ancient people even if they themselves were not fully aware of it. Those Greek sailors in antiquity who invented fantastical tales and legends to explain the vast mysterious ruins on Crete were essentially pulling in ancient aliens. By the time those distant Minoan descendants had returned to their ancestral homeland, they had pretty much forgotten that they themselves were related to the people who had once created the palaces they were gazing up at, in awe, centuries later. I guess history can be pretty weird and poetic that way sometimes. Conclusion, what can we learn from the legacy of the Minoans? Researching the Minoan civilization has been extremely fascinating to me. They are one of those cultures in human history that are often given the shaft, in my opinion, and most people end up never even learning about their society and influence, which is a huge shame because the Minoans are just so incredibly unique and can give us a look at an entirely different trajectory of human history had they survived and gained wider dominance in the past. Perhaps if it weren't for a volcano, you and I might be walking around in thongs and with our boobs out right now. One thing we can learn from their story is that a lot of norms and taboos we hold in our society are just all relative to us in the end. We consider some things weird and inappropriate essentially just because. 
What is considered indecent, or masculine, or feminine, or unmanly, or gay, is all culturally relative in the end. Culture is this constantly changing and shifting thing. The Minoans are a textbook example of the concept of cultural relativism. And just like in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, where nobody even does a double take at a guy dressed up like this, or this, we should understand it's easy to get caught up in our typical modes of thinking and how things should be, rather than approaching viewing other peoples in perhaps a different light. We, just like the Minoans and the Victorians, have our own social restrictions. I will admit, I love wearing crop tops to show off my stomach. But, for the most part today, it's largely seen as something gay, or strange for a guy to wear in public. But this wasn't the case in the 1980s. You can watch a whole bunch of 80s movies and TV shows where male characters walk around like that no problem. It just goes to show you how much cultures can change in a matter of decades. Who knows what will happen over centuries. Perhaps in a thousand years, the Minoan way of fashion with bare-breasted women and men in skimpy skirts, we'll be back in style. You know, I wouldn't have minded dressing like a Minoan guy. Hashtag Minoan Restoration. In any case, I hope we learn more about this amazing ancient culture in the future. Hopefully someday we'll be able to get some definitive answers once somebody is able to crack Linear A. Fingers crossed. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this installment of Trey the Explainer and learned something new. I certainly did. Like and subscribe for more videos on history, biology, and just whatever. Next episode will probably be a dinosaur episode, so stay tuned, and happy Pride Month. Bye!